Hey y'all, what is up? Kisby here. So today I want to talk to y'all about the most common questions I get regarding Flanderies and consolidate them into one video. These are going to be things that, while important, I don't think are quite involved enough for their own video and I really want to emphasize this. This is my opinion based on my own testing and experience. I'm not here to tell you that what I say is the absolute final word on these birds, and like I've said in other videos, if you disagree, I would love to hear why, as I think open dialogue on different ideas for decks helps everyone come to new ideas. But before we get into that, don't forget to drop this video a like, subscribe to the channel for even more, and if you want to help us out that little bit extra, check out the link in the description to grab yourself a Keys BTCG exclusive playmat. The playmats are custom made by me for the channel and our Instagram, and everything from them goes a long way to helping us improve the quality of video that we put out. Okay, so again, I really just want to emphasize this. These are only my opinions from what I've found in testing and playing the deck. I'm not trying to tell anyone they're wrong with this video. That's not the point of what I'm trying to do here. The first thing I get a lot of questions about is how I feel regarding the Simorg engine. To sum this up in Flanderies, Ash Blossom can be pretty killer to a turn 1 if you don't have protection from Map, Called by the Grave, or Gold Sarcophagus. And even then, depending on the makeup of the rest of your hand, Ash can still potentially be a turn ender if you're playing against an opponent who knows the deck well enough. Samorg addresses that problem similar to how Parallel Exceed worked in Prank Kids. On Normal or Special Summon of a Winged Beast, you reveal the Samorg Bird of Perfection, and then once this effect resolves, you normal summon the bird. So playing out the turn, you would normal summon Rubina. Now on summon, you have two simultaneous triggers, Rubina and Bird of Protection, which means under TCG rules, I'm kind of fuzzy on the OCG chain building rules, they function a bit differently than ours. You can now order your simultaneous effects however you want, meaning you can go chain link one Rubina, chain link two Bird of Perfection, protecting your Rubina from Ash. Now everything resolves, you summon Bird, Rubina searches for Eaglin, and on resolution, you summon Eaglin. Now Eaglin and Bird of Perfection have simultaneous triggers. Eaglin to search for a big bird, BOP, as I'm going to call it for time's sake, to dump a Smorg monster from your deck to grave to add a Smorg spell or trap, generally their field spell, which means you can again block for the Eaglin with Smorg, ensuring you get an M-Pen, then with the Flanderies monsters you tributed, you can use one of them to block for M-Pen search. BOP also turns Eaglin into a one card starter in that if the rest of your hand is dead, you can still go Eaglin blocked by BOP, which represents another body to tribute as well, then M-Pen all blocked from Ash. I'll briefly mention the Simorg field spell isn't too bad either, especially given that in this most basic version of the opens, you don't have map. It gives all your wind-winged beasts, so all your big birds, a boost by 300 attack and defense, allows you to reveal a winged beast that's level 5 or higher in your hand and tribute it for one less tribute. A huge side note on this, this does not interact at all with Unexplored Winds since Unexplored Winds removes any tribute of monsters and instead sends to Grave to perform a tribute summon. And lastly, the Smorg Field spell allows you to get one additional normal summon of a winged beast for the turn. Okay, so this all sounds really good, and it is good, don't get me wrong, but why don't I play it? Well, first and foremost is deck space. The bare minimum for this engine is three cards, two BOPs and one of the, we'll just say the field spell in this example to search. But the problem there is that if you hard open any multiple pieces, you are losing the second part of the effect, either from already having the search target or the cost needed to be sent from deck to grave meaning you should realistically be running three BOPs and one search target, two if you want to be very safe, but then you're now going up to a four or five card engine. While I do understand that this is not only protection from Ash and Gamma on turn one, or any form of direct response negation past that point, Barone, Toad, etc., I just feel that you can be using the deck space for other cards that have a bit wider of a range of utility. I do also understand that this plus Eaglin is a path to Mpen and Dreaming Town if the rest of your hand is dead, but a soul Dreaming Town and Ryza on your opponent's turn with no direct response protection for the Eaglin summon is going to be rough. Not to mention you will need to tribute the Mpen at a minimum to do this. This also provides no protection from targeted negates such as Imprimer Veiler, 
which isn't an inherent flaw in the engine itself, but something that I feel takes away enough utility to not make me want to devote four to five slots of deck space to it. Also, important to note is that it conflicts with Dimension Shifter due to BOP's second effect sending to grave for cost. So if your opponent does have Ash, you won't have a chain block for the second bird you summon if you are, for example, starting with this and Rubina. All in all, while it is a good engine and an engine that has seen play in some topping builds, I found that it really was at its best in hands that were already pretty solid without it, and the hands that were reliant on it to force through plays tended to end on boards that were a bit on the fragile side. Again, I want to take a quick moment to say, these are my opinions, and if you like the BOP engine, I don't think it's bad. I just personally prefer a wider variety of utility cards over a lot of specific focus on Ash and to a lesser extent Gamma protection that a decent Flandery's hand already kind of tends to provide. Next is going to be a shorter one, but one along the same lines in the Dogmatica engine. So I've been asked less about this, but it still comes up occasionally. Basically, the Dogmatica engine takes advantage of the fact that Nadir's Servant is more or less free in this deck, is a very big target for Ash Blossom, and the fact that Mpen can normal summon any monster, not just a winged beast. This was a very early tech engine that fell off mostly around the time of Advent of Adventure being released, but with Garura the Resonant Wings, it has been seeing more play as it essentially turns Nadir's Servant into a copy of Sky Striker Engaged. It also gives you easy access to Dogmatica Punishment, which can be comboed with the extra deck we hardly ever use to get a trap that is, in most cases, an easy plus one. So my issues with this are similar to the Smorg engine, in that I think its deck space to what it does ratio isn't quite there enough for me. You'll be running two Nadir Servants, probably one Ecclesia, and one Punishment, taking up four deck slots. Granted, the ability to use Nadir Servant not only to grab Ecclesia to get Dogmatica Punishment and draw a card is very good, this engine hinges on you either already having a full Flounder turn in the five remaining cards, the four in hand and the one you drew off Garura, or the four you drew originally if Nadir Servant is Ashed. This combo again also conflicts heavily with Dimension Shifter, since neither Nadir's Servant or Dogmatica Punishment can resolve under it. They can actually both activate since sending a card from the extra deck to the graveyard is part of the effect and not a cost, but because it gets banished instead, they will resolve without effect. Another issue for me that this shares with the BOP engine is, if you draw the Ecclesia specifically, you now have created two dead draws in Nadir Servant, in a deck that can have consistency issues in the early game. This is, as above, another case where, while I don't think any part of this engine is bad, I just find that using those same spots for other utility cards is generally the better move. It's also worth mentioning that this engine loses a lot of its utility if you are going second, as even backed by a Dark Ruin or more, your native Flanderies plays become a much better route at that point than just devoting your moves to setting up a punishment. Something I do want to touch on between these is a lot of times the reasoning I see for these and other things like it not specifically related to Flanderies is, well, if I don't open well, these can help out. And while that is valid, I personally don't like including engines or cards that help with a bad opening, but become wholly unneeded in a decent to good one. As while, yes, BOP for example does turn Eaglin into a one card starter if you open nothing else good, the end board you end up with is fairly fragile anyway, as previously mentioned, but if you opened well, Eaglin likely won't need to act as a one card starter anymore, and again, at that point, there's a fair chance that the BOP engine is just extra on top of what you're already doing, and I personally would rather see something like Enemy Controller or Harpy's Feather Duster that are going to offer more to my gameplay than just forcing through more birds onto the field. The next one I want to talk about is Harpy's Featherstorm in the main versus the side deck. Okay, so if you don't know, Featherstorm says if you control a wind-winged beast, you can fire this off and negate the activated effects of all your opponent's monsters from the turn from anywhere. It is high-key insane, plus if it's destroyed, you can add a Feather Duster from your deck to your hand, which is also a pretty fetch effect. This is, yet again, another case that I don't think it's wrong to main Featherstorm, but I think it's a better sidecard. 
Featherstorm loses a lot of utility when you're going second into an established board. A big thing to note about it is that, unlike Dark Ruler No More, it doesn't have any form of no response clause on it. So even if you can establish it through your opponent's board, they could still negate it on their own turn. Another thing worth noting is, if you can establish a board, most likely you won't be needing the Featherstorm in the first place if you were going second. If you do win the die roll and can get this into rotation on your first turn, yes, you are in a very good position to take game one for sure, but I've found that even with the volume of cards I personally run that tend to have more utility in a lost die roll, the deck has no problems going first if you draw even in an okay hand. Something that I will say in favor of Featherstorm in the main deck is in a game one, if your opponent does hard stop your combo at Eaglin, you can generally buy yourself a free turn with it, but then that really hinges on the rest of your hand being playable at that point and also really hinges that you got interrupted at Eaglin and not the Rabina beforehand, since she is a water. Another thing to say in favor of Storm in the Main is, if you do go first and have this in rotation, there's a very solid chance you'll win game one, and then even if you lose game two, you'll be going into game three going first and sided in for whatever your opponent's playing. Overall, I just prefer to leave it in the side and slot it in if I'm totally certain I will be going first, and going into a blind round one where I don't know the results of the die roll, I like to go a little more optimized for a go second game over a more aggressive go first game. I just want to take a quick moment to mention that a lot of what I'm talking about is TCG specific, and while there will be some Master Duel crossover, because Master Duel is a best-of-one format with a differing playable card pool, some of this won't apply. For example, I absolutely think Featherstorm is worth maining in Master Duel because you really only have that one chance to get to use it. I mention this now because the consistency pool available in Master Duel is a lot more limited than it is in the TCG, and leading right out of that, this is going to address questions I've seen about consistency cards for the deck. First and foremost being Prosperity versus Extravagance. This is one that I really think comes down to preference, and there's not a set in stone correct answer, though I tend to see more builds on Prosperity. I personally prefer Prosperity over Extravagance for a few reasons. First and foremost, I would much rather get to pick one of six cards than get two random ones off the top. While Extrav is two cards to Prosperity's one, you just have better odds of seeing something you would need off of Prosperity. But again, Extrav is a straight up plus one, and as the game progresses and you have less need for a specific starter, Extrav gains a bit more utility. The other major difference is how they interact with the extra deck. In my personal build, which doesn't use the Dogmatica engine, my extra deck tends to act as an emergency toolbox for weird situations. So it's basically 15 one-ofs, some of which are fairly important pieces to getting to others, such as the charmers helping to get to access code. Extrav changes this up. If you are, for example, running the Dogmatica engine or Ultimate Slayer, you need to triple up on anything that is important to that, and you have less space for general utility, such as Underworld Goddess of the Closed World, a card that is there more or less to address one other card in the format. Prosperity in a deck that doesn't need its extra deck allows for these very specific calls like that, whereas Extrav does not due to the random nature of it. Overall, there are pros and cons to both. I personally like Prosperity more though. Next up is regarding Jack in the Hand. Jack in the Hand allows you to reveal three of our little birds, your opponent takes one to their hand, you take one, and the third is shuffled back into the deck. Now, in Master Duel, there is a huge argument for this card, as you need to boost the consistency of the deck without having access to Advent and with Prosperity being limited at the time of this recording. But in the TCG, I find that 1. This is just one too many consistency cards, and 2. A smart opponent who is familiar with the deck can potentially grab one of the Strier of the Toucan, cutting you off from one of your small birds for the rest of the game. More on the Strier and Toucan ratios later. Alternatively, they could just grab your Rabina, and then if you don't have either map or a second small bird in your hand, likely needing to be Stree, as Tukan most likely won't have a target to recover turn 1, there's not a ton you can really do from there. 
Overall, while I don't think a deck can be too consistent, I do think there is a thing as too many consistency cards whose sole purpose is only consistency. Advent, for example, while being a consistency boost, also acts as protection. Same with Gold Sarcophagus to a certain extent by creating a chain block, whereas something like Jack in the Hand is at its best turn one, and at its worst, past that point when it becomes one of three duality excavates and you already have enough small birds in rotation. The last umbrella topic I want to cover is why aren't you playing two of X? So, ratios. First and foremost, the one I see people talk about playing multiples of the most is Unexplored Winds. I 100% see the appeal of more than one copy of this, but I personally find that one is enough. So Unexplored Winds does have some utility as a turn one card if you bricked but still saw some non-starter winged beasts, allowing you to mulligan them out for one or two new draws. It's also worth noting that if you do hard open Unexplored Winds and haven't used Prosperity during the turn, any extra birds in your hand or eaglin searches that may be left over can be cycled out for potentially good cards to play on your opponent's turn. However, this does conflict with Prosperity, which is 10 out of 10 times the card I'd rather use to dig for a starter over wins. The other thing is too, while Wins is very good in some specific matchups and is universally good in general, I think that its level of utility not only relies on the matchup, but if you already have Dreaming Town and map access. Generally speaking, in a blind game one, I want to have map and Dreaming Town established over Wins. This is mostly because map and Dreaming Town potentially is two Ryza activations with the addition of Dreaming Town Book of Eclipsing my opponent's field, so ultimately stacking two to four cards back to my opponent's deck or recycling some of my own and making my opponent's field unusable for anything besides fusion and tribute summons. While wins would add extra utility to this via acting as very good removal, you don't need it here in the situation described. It becomes very good on your next turn after that though for cleaning up what's left of the field. If you do want to use two wins, I would suggest personally one in the main and one in the side, as wins is very good for going first into a back row heavy matchup and can more or less win you the mirror by itself. But I just think, given you don't need it for a turn one to function, unless your hand is pretty bad already and even then it's luck based, one is enough, and in all honesty, there's a not zero chance you'll end up searching it during your opponent's turn anyway after you have Dreaming Town and Map established. So again, this falls under, I would rather use the deck space for variety. And of course, it would not be a Keysby TCG Flanderies video if I didn't remind everyone that Unexplored Winds and Ryza do have a little bit of a weird confliction in that Ryza's bonus effect of bouncing one card back to hand requires a wind monster to have been tributed. And while Unexplored Winds treats summons enabled by it as tribute summons, it doesn't actually tribute any monsters. It instead sends them to graveyard. Next one is why not play to Dreaming Town? This is an interesting one as you do always want Dreaming Town generally as the first thing in rotation if you had to pick any of your Flandery spell traps to grab off Mpen, and the effect to summon isn't once per turn either, but this is another one that I think is fine at one. Considering this is most likely what you will first search off Mpen and you already have so much other access to map, you'll likely never have trouble getting this in rotation if you didn't already open it. And if you are getting to the point where you will be able to search it, you will likely resolve the search given the amount of things that had to go right prior to that search. On the flip side of that, if you do open it, it opens up your mpen search to map if you get that far. But if you don't get that far, there is a chance that Dreaming Town may not have use at that point and would have been better as another card. For example, if you open Dreaming Town, Rabina, and Stree, if you open with the Rabina and it gets stopped, that Dreaming Town you open because you are on two could have been something else that might have helped force that Rabina through. Whereas now, it's just a long way to a DD Crow effect via the Stree. Additionally, I've never really found the need for hard using two in one turn. Given if I do open one and get to the point where it's a viable card on my opponent's turn, I would much rather get map and rotation than a second Dreaming Town, which, depending on the matchup, can put out a statue on my opponent's turn, then forcing them to play into map. Also, while the effect of summon is not once per turn, the Book of Eclipse effect is, otherwise I would be much more open to a second copy. 
Lastly, as long as this card is not banished face down, it is essentially infinitely recyclable. Overall, I think it's at its best in the majority of situations once you've gotten to a point where you have resolved the search for it, otherwise it is heavily hand dependent on if it will be usable or not if you did hard open it but were interrupted prior to the mpen search resolving. Regarding Stri and Tukan, I do find Stri to be a solid one of, and I don't think you should run multiples of it at the moment. The Ishizu support, however, does have me kinda considering it, as if Stri hits the graveyard, it requires Ryza to get it back in rotation, and Stri is your go-to in that matchup for getting any small bird out of the graveyard and to the banish zone where they want to be, but that's a future thing. Stri is, in my opinion, the worst starter of all the birds, as even it plus map, if there is nothing in Grave to target, requires you to break the chain of summons started by map and use your game mechanic normal summon to continue the combo. Not a huge deal, but just kind of a micro thing that sometimes affects your turns. Tukan as well requires map to be a lone starter, but is significantly the better one with map as map's effect turns Tukan's effect on, but I am also only on one Tukan personally, as again, it requires map or advent and another small bird to act as a starter by itself, and the difference in percentage for drawing a small bird doesn't differ that greatly between one and two copies of Tukan. The last why not two I commonly see is Barrier Statue. So on the whole from games I've watched, I do think there's a bit too much reliance on Statue as a win condition, where I personally feel it should be treated as an interruption. I usually tend to only make it turn one if I have nothing else to do, or if things go fairly wrong and I have to really low roll a hand. I find Statue is at its best when you can drop it on your opponent's turn at a weird time in their combo, either turning it off entirely or forcing them to play into map, then using what Flanderies does naturally to protect the statue. Hard opening a statue is very dependent on the rest of your hand. You will 100% have hands that statue passes kind of all you can do, but any good deck will end up being able to out that, so generally you really don't want to see statue in your opener, but would rather search it, and I think even more ideally, search it on your opponent's turn. In favor of two though, I will say, most people don't expect it, and dropping a second one after the first one has been dealt with can be very strong in certain matchups, so again, if you do want to play two, I would suggest one in the main and a second one in the side deck. Next, for the ones I don't play at all, Flanderies and the Scary Sea sounds incredible on paper. If you control a face-up tribute summon monster and no special summoned monsters of your own, if your opponent would special summon, you can, on counter trap speed, negate the summon, bounce it back to the hand, or extra deck if that's where it came from, and lock them on specialing for the turn, but in exchange they can normal summon and set up to three times that turn. So I'll start by saying this, it is a little bit matchup dependent, but tends to be very good as most decks are not going to be able to do much more than just flood the field, and aside from that, maybe do some very light setup. The main issue of this card comes from its activation requirement of having a tribute summon monster. So if you have reached the point in your turn, odds are things are going your way already and searching for Dreaming Town is probably actually going to be more impactful because not only is Dreaming Town going to give you the potential to go into another Tribute Summon monster, your choice depending on the matchup, it's going to force flip your opponent's field face down. So whereas Scary Sea is locking resources your opponent has in hand for later use, Dreaming Town, the better search if you had to pick between the two, is going to waste those same resources by making them dead on the field and offer upside as well in the additional summons. And again, hard opening Scary Sea, its usefulness is entirely contingent on your turn hitting the point where you would have been able to search it. If you did really want to play this, I would highly suggest siding one, but keep in mind, while not searchable like this is, Harpy's Featherstorm almost accomplishes the same game state while actually being more versatile in letting you use it with just an eaglin or statue on field worst case scenario. And the last is Flanderies and Snowl. This question doesn't come up often, but I still want to address it. Snowl is very cool, but is kind of situational in ways that don't fully seem logical. The three summons, given that you have a finite amount of small birds to activate per turn, isn't as useful as it sounds. It does work very well in combination with Unexplored Winds and Apex Avion, 
But if you have the setup to really be taking advantage of that, essentially summoning Apex Avion aided by winds, then negating the small bird you tributed, returning to hand with Apex, getting it back to your hand to summon again, you're likely winning regardless. So far as the Book of Eclipse effect for special summon monsters that Snowl has, it is very strong, but generally speaking, you are going to want to search Mpen Turn 1, which will give you access to Dreaming Town, and then from there you will likely search Ryza on your opponent's turn, allowing for Dreaming Town to do what Snow would have done, plus getting Ryza into rotation and doing some deck stacking on top of that. There is something to be said about having access to a second Book of Eclipse effect, but I find that generally Ryza was the stronger go-to from that position. Snell's usually does get better the better your setup is going into your opponent's turn, but the same could also be said for Ryza as well. The last thing is another deck space specific issue to tribute summon monsters. I don't like the idea of adding another one due to Flandry's inherent consistency issues at times. So again, I really want to emphasize if you're doing or playing anything I mentioned in this video, I'm not telling you you're wrong, I'm just giving my personal opinion on it and the reasoning for how and why I've made the choices I've made in my deck building. I'm going to sum this up with my high level take on the deck and deck builds overall. I try to play the minimum of everything possible. My general rule is starters or anything you always want to be seeing turn one is played at three. Stuff that is semi-situational but still very strong generically at two. And anything heavily searchable, recyclable, or, you know, limited at one. Especially if searching that card is a natural part of your combo. Overall, I think that Flanderese is not a deck that you should aim to out-resource your opponent with, but instead make their resources unusable. Your turn one should generally act as setup to play on your opponent's turn, then on your opponent's turn you should aim to make the biggest macro interruptions you can, as I don't think Flanderese is well positioned to make a lot of smaller micro interactions, then your turn three is cleanup and cementing yourself in control of the game. While it can win fast, I do think it rewards a patient control-oriented game, but it does offer some chances to take risks and overextend a bit as well. Generally, I like a bit of a jack-of-all-trades kind of vibe over the hyper-focused line of play that I feel something like the BOP engine creates for the deck. Granted, I've 100% lost a game that BOP might have saved me in, but I've also won games by virtue of having a varied toolset because I didn't have to dedicate 4-5 to five slots of deck space to the Bird of Perfection engine, and I'm sure someone on that same engine could say the exact same thing in reverse, as again, decks that are more streamlined in that way have topped events, but so have decks that seem to be riding on the way I prefer to play the deck as well, so it comes down to playstyle and preference. So a late in scripting last thing that I do want to add to this is, I don't find that Flanderese generally is a deck where you can count on the idea of, well, this card will buy me one more turn to draw a starter and go off from there, as we only really have one pure one card starter, and the ability to start with other cards is a bit contingent on what we already have in our hand. So, whereas the idea of playing and deck building in a way that you want to stall out a turn to draw a starter would work better with something like how Prank Kids was with Meow Meow Mew, obviously the loss of Meow Meow Mew is still near to my heart, I don't think that that's the right move for Flanderese specifically. Again, I really just want to emphasize that this video isn't intended to tell anyone that they're wrong, and I just really want to emphasize that, but this is more to address some common questions I've been asked and other ones that I've seen in a semi-coherent ranting video. I'll end off with this, whether you agree or disagree with any of my takes on the deck, at least hear out why I feel how I feel. Like I've said, I think in about half of my videos, just always make sure you understand why you're doing or playing something the way you are, and you will have a much better time doing so. As always, thank all y'all for watching. If you learned something, don't forget to drop this video a like, subscribe to the channel for even more, and again, if you want to help us out that little bit extra, as always, check out the link in the description to grab yourself a Keysby TCG exclusive playmat, and I will catch y'all later.